Today's date is August 5th, and the time is 2334 hours. Present is myself, Captain Eric Grile, also Captain Doyle Wright, Sergeant David Darko, and his counsel, Attorney Vincent Pop. Um, Dave, if, David, if you would just give me a verbal statement on what occurred from start to finish uh, up at the Walmart this evening. All right. Um, I was at um, Sergeant Spangler's residence talking to him when the call came out, so I was relatively close. Um, when the call came out, I proceeded to Walmart Code 3. Um, I arrived near um, the garden center because um, there was reports <clears throat> coming from dispatch that a um, male that was armed was in the back near the, um, the pet food aisles and he was in the corner. Um, as I was responding, dispatch updated, kept us updated from callers who were calling in um, saying that uh, they believed he was armed with some sort of a rifle, that he was um, either waving it or pointing it at people, um, and that he was um, he was in he was still in the the pet food or the or the pet aisles that corner, um, and so I pulled up to the garden center, uh, knowing that the, the pet area is is right around the corner from that. Um, I arrived second on scene uh, to Sean Williams, um, who had, um, as soon as I pulled up, uh, he came over to my location. Um, he had uh, his, his AR, I believe it's his personal. Um, I ran back to the vault, got my AR, um, got Molnar's flak jacket that he keeps back there with the mags. <clears throat> and uh, the two of us proceeded to try to make entry into Walmart near the garden entrance. However, it was locked. Unfortunately, we had that caused us to have to go down to the the next entrance, which um, which would be the, the uh, westernmost entrance to Walmart. Uh, we enter there. And um, it appeared business as usual, and it seemed as though no one really knew what anything was going on. Um, the greeter, I remember the greeter was still there, saw us, got a shocked look. I, I was telling people as we went by and they saw us um, carrying our rifles, I was telling them to seek cover and, and, and get out. So I was yelling at people, and, and, um, and we both made our way, um, you know, Right, right by each other. Made our way back um, to the furthest western um, corner. It would be the the western southern corner of Walmart, which is where the the pet aisles are located. Um, when we got to that area, um, you know, we we began um, progressing down each aisleway, trying to to locate um, the person. And when we got to the very last aisle. Um, I saw a black male, he looked like he had dreadlocks. Um, he was standing in the corner of the store. Um, he had the rifle, it was a black AR style rifle, I believe. <clears throat> he was holding it um, in what we would call kind of a, a low righty type position. He was, I don't know what he was trying to do with the rifle, but he was looking down with it. Um, he had his left hand, um, you know, on the, on the stock portion, and then, um, and then he was messing with the rifle with his right hand. But I could, I, he was turned in such a way I couldn't see what he was doing with the rifle, and he was looking down at at the rifle. Um, I took a position near the end cap where, um, where I was a little bit covered by the end cap of the aisle. Um, but I could see him. And <clears throat> Sean must have come up behind me um, to a position where he was more in the center of the aisle. To um, your right. He was, Sean would be to my right okay. at this point. Um, he was initially behind me as we were going up the aisles, but when I stopped at the aisle, he came up around me and was now toward, more towards the middle of the aisle. Um, I initially, I think, I believe I was the first one. 
um, to engage him verbally and give him verbal commands to drop the, drop the gun. Um, so drop the gun. Um, uh, I remember hearing Sean yell at him to, to drop the weapon. Um, I yelled at him to get on the ground. Um, as soon as I gave the very first verbal command to drop the gun, he startled. I mean, he noticeably startled back. Um, he, he looked up, saw us, and, and startled. We shocked him. It was very evident that, that, um, that our presence had, had shocked him. Um, he, he did not drop the gun. He did not get on the ground, um, despite both of us giving him uh, verbal commands to do so. Um, in fact, he's, he began making um, motions as though he was either going to duck behind the end cap or dart uh, would have been east through the store. Um, that's as best as I can describe it. Um, he was kind of in a, a backpedaling motion while heading um, a little bit further east. But he was still holding the rifle in like a low ready type of position. Um, <clears throat> I began to start to go draw back um, in case he made it from his current position to the next aisle over. And right as I started to, to move back, because um, I was starting to lose sight of him as he was darting east, um, where Sean was further out in the middle of the aisle, he had a better vantage point than I did. Um, now, had he continued, I would have been able to intercept him in the next aisle over. But I heard, I believe I heard two rounds from Sean's rifle go off. And um, the suspect initially dropped, um, I seem to recall him dropping the rifle at that point. Um, and then suddenly, he almost looked like he was going to get back up. He mumbled something or muttered something, and I, it, I, I couldn't hear what he, I couldn't hear what he said, um, partially because the shots had rang in my ear, and I could, I, I, I lost hearing in my right ear completely. But he, he started to get back up, and um, it still proceed uh, east, just like before. And I went even further over to see if he, it crossed my mind whether he had missed him or whether he was even shot because he was starting to get back up again. And when I went over to that other, um, towards that other aisle, he went back down again and didn't get back up. Um, we approached him. I covered the suspect while Sean uh, handcuffed him. And at this point, uh, there was other officers started arriving on scene. Um, he was still breathing, uh, but he was he was bleeding. And I, I mean, I could tell his um, his elbow was completely gone, and um, he was on his front, and there was blood starting to pull. So I knew he had he had taken significant injuries. Uh, I immediately uh, called dispatch. Said shots were fired and um, we needed a uh, medic immediately. <clears throat> As the officers came on scene, Officer Williams, Bondi, and Stahl, I don't know in what order. You're referring to Officer Chris Williams at that point? Chris then. Williams okay. arrived on scene. Um, Bondi and Stahl are the three I remember getting there in some order. Um, and I told, I started telling them to um, get people out, but make sure we identify our witnesses, cordon off the area. Um, Officer Chris Williams took tape and um, and started cordoning off the area, tape it, roping it off. Um, Officer Stahl um, told him to, well, actually Sean Williams told him go get a first aid kit. So. He ran out to get a first aid kit so we could try to render first aid. So Stall did. Stall's Stall one. Stall made. Okay. Stall right. did. All right. So it's Stall getting a first aid kit. Um, Bondi getting people out of the area nicely. I believe I told at some point I saw her and told her to do the, what Bondi was doing. 
And then Chris Williams was wrapping it off. Um, Let's we'll see. Is I mean, he, he was. Uh, I could see his eyes rolling back in his head, and, and you know, continued to bleed out. They tried to put a tourniquet on his arm, um, but it was clear there was another wound of some of some kind, um, in his in his possibly in his chest area. I don't know, but it was bleeding in a place we couldn't necessarily get to or or a tourniquet. <clears throat> Medics arrived, um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm forgetting. Do you know approximately how long it was from the time you arrived till um, this incident had taken place, the shooting had taken place? Time is, is really tough um, to gauge. I mean, it was. I know it was short because we were we we weren't running, but we were briskly walking through Walmart, um, looking for the suspect. looking for the suspect. And you know, both of us had we knew, both knew the layout of the store, so we both knew we we went straight to him. It's not like we were looking around Walmart for him or asking for directions. We both knew where the pet area was, so we literally went right in that. <laughs> Right in that western door, and went and, and cut across the pharmacy aisle straight back to the pet store. Immediately engaged him. I mean, it, it couldn't have been more than a minute. <laughs> it was quick. But from that standpoint, did you fire your weapon at all? No. Okay. Um, I didn't have as good of, of a, a vantage point on on the suspect, so. Had he made it, I probably would have. Had he made it um, across that aisle to where I was closer to. And you say probably would have. Can you articulate to me, and you already have, but it, yeah. could you again hit for me the reason you felt that that would have been necessary? Because we had a, a suspect who posed, what I felt posed a serious threat of, of physical, serious physical harm or death to ourselves and everyone else um, in Walmart by having control and possessing um, a deadly firearm or what we believed could be a, a deadly firearm. AR style rifle, um, don't, we, we had dispatch saying that um, one, one person thought he was loading it. So, so we possibly had a, a, a suspect with a loaded AR style rifle who was not obeying our commands to put it down, was not obeying commands to get down on the ground, and was startled by our presence and was trying to either take some kind of position of advantage or cover, or was trying to get out of our line of sight or line of, line of fire so that he could do whatever he, his plan was to do. But I knew one thing, and that was there was no way we could allow him to get out, be uncontained in that area, and get out into this um, a very populated store with a with a rifle, and possibly put everyone in there in danger. Um, at some point, Officer Williams' rifle ended up in uh, your car. My back explained to me how. Okay. Um, after things settled down. I'm going to interrupt real quick. The time is 23.46 hours, and Captain Light Wright is leaving the room. Go ahead. I'm sorry. After things kind of um, were settling down, and I, and I felt as though the immediate threat was over, we had one suspect. Um, I went ahead and gave Sean my rifle and took his rifle that was used in the shooting. Um, I took that rifle and secured it in the back of my car. And you drive which marked vehicle? 135. Thank you. I gave my rifle to, um, or actually, um, I had given my rifle to Sean Williams. Um, but when we, when I decided to call a medic for Sean and get him out of that area, 
Um, he ended up giving my rifle to stall. Okay. So I, I wasn't aware that you called for a medic for Sean also? Yes. Okay. We had, um, we had a medic coming for the suspect who was down. We had another medic coming for a female, um, an older female um, who had was believed to be suffering from a heart attack related to the, this incident that occurred. Was that near you? Was she near you? I don't or know. You? Okay. All right. I don't know where that was happening. I just okay. caught that on the radio. Got it. Right. Um, I was there with Sean. Didn't leave Sean's side. Okay. Was there with the suspect. So I don't. I don't know where that was. I saw some commotion just to the north of us in the store, and maybe that was it, up by where the bikes would be, bikes and, and um, outdoor sporting type mm -hmm. stuff. Maybe it was there, I don't know. Okay. And then I also received word that um, we called for another medic because another person thought they were having a heart attack or was having a, a heart attack. Um, so, and then I called for a fourth medic for Sean. And based on my training, um, you know, that's, that's what was advised uh, for me to do as a supervisor was to get a medic en route for him, to get him away from the scene, get his vitals, check him over, make sure he's okay, um, and stay with him. So that's what I did. When you said um, you secured his rifle in the back of 135, can you tell me where? Just in the back seat. I had a bunch of equipment in there. Um, That's where I at this point, I didn't sure. know I was going to be going in the medic with Sean, <laughs> so so I just put it, I just set it back there just to get it secured right. and know where it's at in my own mind. Um, I ended up going in the medic with uh, with Sean though, and happened to leave my vehicle. I mean, I secured the vehicle. Right. But Did uh, why did you ride the medic? Curious for yourself or for Sean? For Sean. Okay, all right, gotcha. And I and then I told um, I think I told Fiorita that hey, I'm going, I'm leaving my car here. I'm not going to have a car. I'm riding in the medic with Sean. So he knew um, somewhere at the beginning of all this, uh, Sergeant Molnar I had responded up to the scene, thank God, and took over kind of a command pos um, scene position because there is that that would be impossible for me to do at that point in the position that I was in. Somebody needed to be in control of everything else that was going on, who wasn't actively involved in the actual incident and in dealing with the officer who was involved. So it just worked out. He hadn't gone home yet. Anything else you can think of? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. If not, we'll conclude. All what right. Um, this will be the end of the recording, end of the statement. The time is 2351.